What's up guys? Welcome to a brand new episode of the Fit Women's Weekly Podcast. I'm so excited to have you here and even more excited to jump right into this episode because I am joined by Sam Matthews. Sam is a um, content creator, but on top of that, she is also a surrogate. And in case you guys have ever wondered a bit about surrogacy, just, you know, we've kind of heard it a little bit more frequently in like the celebrity realm, and I am very intrigued by it. So Sam has been a surrogate once before. She is actually going through the process of being a surrogate right now. And so with that, we break it down. We talk about how she explains it to her family, to her children, how she navigates the feelings of carrying somebody else's baby and then walking away at the very end. It was a really, really empowering and motivational talk that I cannot wait for you guys to listen. And make sure that you stick around to the end because we actually do break off topic because she gives one of the best meal prep tips that I've heard in a really long time. And I'm very disappointed in myself that I wasn't able to come up with this idea first. So without further ado, we're gonna jump into this episode. Make sure if you haven't already to subscribe to the Fit Women's Weekly Podcast. If you love this episode, please make sure to share it. Always tag me, Kindle Boyle Fitness over on Instagram. If you're not already following me, what the heck are you doing? Make sure to follow me. I put out brand new workouts and recipes every single day. So check that out. All right, guys, let's jump into this episode. Well, Sam, I know that you are short on time and you are so busy. So um, just kind of one of my first questions to you is I know that you and your husband have the social media channel as well. What came first, your surrogacy journey or your social media presence and how Um, did it all become? Yeah. So social media came first in the fall of 2019. My daughter was, I think, about six months and no, actually she was a year, a year and six months. And I was, I felt like I was losing myself as a mom and wanted to like find something to do. And I, you know, would be scrolling online and see, saw all these women sharing just about their life and, um, traveling a lot of RV stuff. And so I always wanted an RV to live in, but it wasn't really in the cards for us in Colorado. Cause the price of RV living was the same as like living in an apartment at the time. Really? So it's not. Yeah. Like, so like to be able to park the RV and everything. You have to pay for the site. And then if you lease the RV, then you're paying for the RV or you have like a loan on it. So the payments were pretty much the same. So we're like, well, that doesn't make sense. But we ended up finding one that we ended up renovating. And I followed all these like RV renovation accounts and just got inspiration from them. And I was like, well, now that we have an RV, like I'm going to start sharing that. And so it gave me something to do, something to look forward to. So shared a lot of RV renovation um, for a couple of years and then started sharing about our family because I knew that RV renovation wasn't going to be our end game. Like Mm -hmm. we're, I didn't feel this calling to be an RV renovator. It was, you did get into it like right at time because it really boosted, like became a big thing in 2020. (laughs) Yes. With COVID, like the market was crazy and we built a lot of interest in that and really got our following started just from that. And then from there we did, we ended up living in the RV when we moved back to Missouri. And so it kind of gave me that RV life content to share. Um, But around that same time of us moving from Colorado back to Missouri, I started to think about surrogacy and I'm like, well, we share our life already online Mm -hmm. and we share, you know, one of a part of our life is our renovation. So if I'm going to pursue surrogacy, like why not share that as well? Mm -hmm. Just like, Hey, we're Dane and Sam. Here's our life. Sometimes it's travel. Sometimes it's RV. Sometimes it's family. And now it's surrogacy because I look to social media for an example or like tips of like, what is a surrogate and how, like, what's, the process of going through surrogacy, how to become a surrogate, what are the steps? And I couldn't find a lot. There was one gal that I ended up following on TikTok, Mama Rupert. And at the time she was sharing her surrogacy, her surrogacy journey, but that was it. And it wasn't anything from start to finish. Mm -hmm. And I really wanted to share the process from start to finish, how it works with matching with a couple, um, seeing if you meet the requirements to become a surrogate, how to talk to your husband about surrogacy you know, how to mentally prepare, physically prepare. Um, And so, yeah, we just started sharing that, sharing that process and that journey. And it built a lot of just interest because it's something that's new. It's not, I mean, now I'm thankful it's getting talked about more and you're seeing it more, but before years back, it wasn't as common and people 
people knew of it or they see baby mama and have that perception of it. And, right. you know, to share the truth behind it or like our hearts behind it, I thought was really important because some see it as a negative thing or see that, oh, like as a surrogate, we're only in it for the money. And so I really wanted to kind of destigmatize surrogacy and just like um, open people's like minds up to it, hearts up to it, and just share from experience that way. If others were following or wanted to become one, they kind of knew what to expect. And then I just think that's ridiculous for anyone to be like, you're doing it just for the money because you're putting your body through the biggest, hardest stress that it could ever go through in a human, in a woman's life. And so to be like, to say like, yeah, I'm just in it for the money. Like, no, there has to be true passion behind what you do. So then what is that? Because you have two children of your Mm -hmm. own, right? So what made you wake up one day and say like, Hey, I'm going to look into being a surrogate. Did you know somebody or I mean, I didn't watch a TikTok and say, Hey, let me do this. (laughs) Exactly. Yeah. And it was before I ever saw anything online about it. Um, I did see the movie baby mom and I always thought, you know, it was kind of a cheesy movie, but funny. And um, I, after we had our daughter, she was a little bit more work than our son. Our first born was so easy, slept, nursed well, like everything was perfect. And my daughter was kind of the opposite, you know, cried. It just took her a lot longer to work through different stages than he did. And we always talked about having four kids, you know, kind of when you get married, you think, what is your family going to look like? So we talked about four and we wanted to have them kind of quick. That way our kids, we can have kids be out of the baby phase stage and then, you know, grow with our kids and make memories and stuff. But after my daughter, we kind of looked at each other and we're like, we kind of feel good. We have our son, we have a daughter and we feel like this two to two ratio is good. Um, you know, let's not have any more. And at the but same you know, time, pregnancy with both of them was very easy, very easy. Yeah. Very easy. Um, textbook pregnancy delivery, natural 38 and a half weeks, both of them healthy pregnancy, great nursing, great sleeping. Like the, it was, it was in my eyes, what, like perfect candidate for surrogacy. And so in looking at that, well, before that, I kind of, I wasn't, I was settled with not having any more kids, but I wasn't at peace with not being pregnant anymore because I did enjoy being pregnant. And Uh thankfully I was able to like keep running while I was, um, while I was pregnant and, you know, work out and eat healthy. And we went camping pregnant, like I was pregnant, like all these normal day-to-day tasks and things that I love and enjoy doing, I was able to do, I was pregnant. And so I wanted to experience that again, but I was like, I don't want any more babies. (laughs) And so I was just thinking about it. I was having a conversation. I thought about surrogacy and then I was like, ah, I don't know. And I was having a conversation with a friend and she was like, are you guys having more kids? I'm like, no, I think we're good. The question that everybody always asks. Yeah. (laughs) Are you guys having more kids? Because she had, I think like three or four at the time. I was like, no, honestly, I think we're good. I was like, but I still miss, I would miss pregnancy. Like I would love to be pregnant again. And she was like, you should be a surrogate. And I was like, actually, I've thought about it. I haven't talked to Dan about it. I haven't like prayed about it much, but just thought about it. But the fact that you're saying that now to me is kind of confirmation that I need to research this more, look into it. And so I did some research um, for a little bit and then mentioned it to my husband. It was like, hey, so what's your thought? I'm like, I've been kind of thinking about this lately. What's your thought on me becoming a surrogate? And he's like, well, I don't want to give away our baby. And I explained, well, it's not our baby. Not, yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's not as a gestational, yeah, as yeah. a gestational surrogate, I would, it would be someone else's embryo. It wouldn't be, would it be genetically related to the baby? I would just be pregnant with the baby, be the oven mm-hmm. and have their baby for them. And he was like, huh okay and like we talked about it and a week later he was like all right let's do it I'm like sweet so yeah it just kind of was one of those things I felt like if my body is able to why not help someone else who's struggling like I have my body has one life on this earth why not if it's able to like continue using it for good and these families who are struggling to have a baby and have that desire and can't but yet I'm sitting here able it just feels weird for me to be like oh well sorry, you know, can't do anything for you when you can. So that's awesome. I have a girlfriend of mine who has zero desire to have children, but the women in her family are always been super fertile. Uh So in her early twenties, I think she did it two times. She donated her eggs because she's like, I know that genetically I've got these great eggs and it's not fair for me who refuses to use them to not give somebody else the opportunity to have a baby. Yeah. And some people just don't have the desire to have kids, you know, to each their Mm -hmm. own and how they choose to live their life. But yeah, if you're able to, you're able to help someone in that way. Like, you know, why not? 
Yeah. So then what was the next step? I mean, where do you like, do you yeah. go to Google? Like, that, honestly, that was, <laughs> it was, that was me. Cause I was like, I have no context other than the movie of like how to pursue this. So I went straight to Google and that was one of the reasons why I was like, I need to help give some resources to people starting out. Like if I'm interested in this, where do I start? How do, what's the process look like? Where do I go? And so I literally typed in Google surrogacy agencies near me and in Colorado, it like popped up with three. I was like, all right, I'm going to call the first three that I see. And I like went online, filled out applications for each or like in inquiry forms or whatever. Um, one called me back and she was cranky. One did not call me back. And then one called me back and she was like super sweet and friendly. And I was like, okay, sure. We're going with them. Mm -hmm. Um, and started the process through them. So you can match independently through like a Facebook group or, you know, a family, a friend or, um, you know, someone that you know that that needs a surrogate, you can match that way or through an agency and then they help guide you through the process, um, do background check, you know, make sure you you meet the requirements and everything. And so ended up meeting with them. And long story short, we went through like background check, home visit, and um, my medical records were cleared. And then we did like a psych evaluation because you have to make sure you're like, you know, mentally stable to you're go through this. You're not going to try to like process. steal the baby at the end. Yeah, you're not going to like try sure. to steal the baby or like, you know, fall off your rocker, like it's something crazy. And so um, I like, I'm mentally all there, and but I do not do well at tests. Like I'm not a good test taker. I failed out at nursing school because I could not mm -hmm. like pick the right, there's the right answer, but then there's the more right answer that you have sure. to pick. And, like I would never pick, I'd be like, oh, it's this one, but I like, failed to see. And so the personality test that the psychologist gave me, the interview was great. She like, I passed my, the interview with Dan, he passed, but the test was 300 questions. And I'm like in this little office in downtown Denver, like trying to answer these questions. And by like 50, you're like, this is so tiring. And you can't <laughs> give a thought to like the question and the answer. You just have to like answer. Well, I am a thinker and the questions are like, would you, do you get angry when someone doesn't follow the law? And you're like, well, I, I don't get angry. Like I'm not an angry person, but like you should follow the but law. It's annoying. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so how do I answer this? I'm like, uh, true slightly true like anyways like, have so I, I ever accidentally flick somebody off driving probably yeah, like, probably and so you can't think about it and I don't even remember what I ended up putting but after I talked it through with her she was like oh that makes sense like why you would have answered that way but it was actually this I'm like okay that makes sense too uh -huh. so I didn't end up passing to the standards of the agency so I like couldn't continue with them which was devastating because I'm like sure. what happened I felt this I like, promise I'm I'm, yeah. I'm straight <laughs> I'm literally yeah I called my OB and I was like, can you tell me that I'm normal? Cause I talked her through with her, like doing surrogacy and kind of getting her. Okay. Cause she would be delivering. And I was like, do you, I was like, am I okay? She was like, yeah, that test. She's like, I would fill that test. I'm like, okay, good. I called my friend <laughs> the counselor. I was like, can you tell me that I'm normal? Um, uh, but it's a hard test. And so, um, but I think I chop it up now looking back as the timing wasn't there because we ended up moving a few months after back home to Missouri. And that would have been so hard to like start the process with the agency match with a couple in Colorado and then move and be like, so mm -hmm. honestly, the way it worked out was good. It got my feet wet of like learning the process, learning the lingo, figuring out the requirements and the steps of it. But then once we were back home in Missouri, having our support, our family and friends here, um, it was honestly like that that was the perfect timing because through pregnancy, you know, you need like, there's days where I'm exhausted or, you know, and you can't do anything and you need family member and support. And so I'm glad it all worked out the way that it did. It was kind of the trial run up there just to kind of get a test run exactly. of what the process is. And then once you're settled can, down, you're like, okay, now I can do this. Yeah. Can Sam handle this? Okay. She can. Yeah. Do they generally else. want surrogates to start after you've delivered your own children to kind of see like, are you prone to postpartum depression yeah. or kind of to see how things work naturally? Yeah. Um, they make sure you're off of, I think you have to be off of antidepressant depressants and anti-anxiety medication for about 12 months. So just because someone has been on it doesn't mean they don't qualify to become a surrogate. They just have to be off of it. And so a lot of times if you you uh, match with an agency, they'll make sure that you're off of it for a while. Um, but the main thing is we know that pregnancy is a risk and child, um, you know, pregnancy and delivery is a risk and there's so much involved in it and even more so IVF pregnancies. And so just in case you were to lose your reproductive organs or something were to happen, you wouldn't want to lose that and then look back and be like, but, but I wasn't done having kids because mm -hmm 
having my own kids because you would hold like resentment and bitterness towards whether it's the surrogate baby or towards the couple or, you know, towards someone else. And you wouldn't want that. That's not to say that after you had deliver, you know, if everything was great and, and healing was great, that you can't go back and have your own kids. You can, and I know right. surrogates you have, but to kind of be mentally ready and okay and at peace with if something did happen, would I be okay not having any more of my own kids? Mm-hmm. I would. Okay, then let's go for, move forward with surrogacy because you I never think, know what stuff could yeah, happen. Like, yeah, for sure. I remember this it sounds terrible comparing it to this, but I remember my uncle was a dog breeder. And mm-hmm. when I got one of my dog, my, my first dog, I was like, oh, maybe I'll breed her. And I remember mm-hmm. him telling me, only breed your dog if you're okay with the slight chance that she could die like there's a risk of this and if you're not okay accepting that risk then don't breed your animals and I was like yeah you're right I can't do it (laughs) yeah it's it's a mentally like wearing game I mean yes as puppies too because it's a lot on them pregnancy is a lot and some some people can handle it and some people can't and different you know the older you get it's harder on you or different environments or it's you know, going through a surrogacy journey, there's a lot of stress involved. There's a lot of weight that we carry as surrogates to, even though a lot of stuff is out of our control of if an embryo implants or not, if a transfer is successful or not, it's a lot of it is we have nothing, like there's nothing we can do to make it work or kind of not make it work. As long as you follow your protocol from your doctor, you know, when on you do what you're supposed to, but there's, it's like, if you, if you do it all, like and stuff doesn't happen, that just sometimes happens and it's not your fault, but yeah. when I know that you have to give yourself like injections mm-hmm. to get your hormones and stuff ready. And so I feel like one of the questions, at least in my mind is when they're doing the transfer, do they try to make it so that the embryo or the fertilized embryo is as fresh as possible versus like freezing it and waiting for your ovulation period? Yeah. Like, How does that work? Yeah. You can do a fresh embryo transfer or a frozen embryo transfer. Um, from what I have heard or researched, I believe the frozen embryo transfer has a higher success. And so a lot of times they'll do the frozen embryo transfer and they work based off of your cycle. Um, last year, I wasn't on birth control. And so we worked with my cycle a lot of times, probably like 75% or higher you're on birth control, just so the fertility clinic can monitor your cycle and manipulate it because of their schedule. They have so many surrogates or so many transfers Mm -hmm. that if you start your cycle on a day earlier than you're supposed to, they can't, it's an embryo. Like they can't thaw it out and then like refreeze it and be like, Oh, uh, oopsie. Like, so working with your cycle is really important. And with, um, the medication, you know, if it's a five day old embryo, then I start progesterone five days earlier. I'm on medication now just to suppress ovulation, but the injections, um, help prepare your body for pregnancy. Because when you get pregnant naturally, your body creates those hormones on its own and it starts fostering that, that embryo and, you know, the egg and whatever it starts, it knows that that's what's happening. But if you just implant this, you know, quote for an object of an embryo into your uterus, your body is like, what the heck's going on? And then you're just you know, it's going to get rid of it. Um, but to, to start almost like an organ transplant, like they're making sure it doesn't get rejected. Yeah. They're making sure your body accepts it and it, and it takes it and it starts to implant. And so the progesterone, if it's five days before you start progesterone, five days before transfer, it's a six day old embryo, you do six days. And so the, and you're already kind of on estrogen to thicken that lining. So the estrogen and the progesterone ahead of time before transfer really preps your body. And then that way, when you're pregnant, it's like, oh, there's baby. And then you keep the progesterone going just to help foster the implantation and the growth of the embryo. Interesting. I definitely yeah. want to talk about the contracts, but I also want to talk about like the psychology of like a normal woman who yeah. is pregnant. So I know people are listening, being like, okay, we know of like Kim Kardashian and stuff like that. Or uh, I think even Nicole Kidman that have yeah. done surrogacy in the past. And you're kind of going like, what did they put in their contract? Yeah. What kind of things are normal? Um, do you get to choose your own OB or is that something that you write up? Do they get to tell you, you have to avoid Turkey? You know, do they get to put diet, diet limitations on you or exercise yeah. rules? What kind of things get put into a contract? Yeah. So there's normal things like, um, no alcohol consumption, no drug use. Um, and most of the time I want to say caffeine is like restricted or none. Um, 
and you have to abstain from intercourse prior to transfer and then after transfer just to make sure it's the embryo that you're pregnant with not your own baby which did um, you just hear there was actually just a a news article about a woman who went in for her ultrasound with one baby came back for her second ultrasound and she had three babies she had a set of oh twins God. because she ovulated I again I think I did see that yeah <laughs> and it's like super infraction or something it's called something. where you can get pregnant after you're pregnant mm-hmm. and I was so scared of that well I was <laughs> scared of like getting pregnant and not being I'm like I had that fear which was so irrational because we like we waited longer than we had to just in case and even saw multiple ultrasounds where it was like okay that was their that's their baby that's their baby and then I'm like okay we're in the clear um but up until delivery I'm like if this baby comes out looking like me I'm like (laughs) but it can happen and there's times where the transfer doesn't take and then it's someone else's baby and so you have to like that's why contracts are so important that if that does happen well financially, how does that work? You know, legal guardianship, custody, how does that work? What, you know, there's just so much involved. And so the contracts, it's like, it talks about guardianship, who's the guardian of the baby, you waive your rights. Um, If something happens to the intended parents, where does baby go? Um, It talks about insurance, compensation, you know, when you'll be compensated, how much, at what points in the pregnancy, um, through what method, you know, through an escrow company, direct deposit, all that. Um, and Do then parents a lot about, of times want to be in the delivery room with you. Yeah. So, um, a lot of times there are some, they don't like, if there's a couple from China, then, you know, I've heard of the dad staying outside the mom coming in or just both of them not being there. Um, typically though, they want to be involved because it's their baby, you know, they've waited yeah. years for this and want to be a, a part of their baby entering and coming in to the world. But also on the other side, some surrogates aren't comfortable with that. And that's, that's why at the matching phase, it's so important because you really want someone that you have like similar interests, similar beliefs, where you're in this relationship with them for a year Mm -hmm. plus sometimes two years or sometimes more. And so you want not everyone has to have a relationship, but you want to at least be cordial, be able to like make decisions together, be okay with what the other person desires in the journey. And you want those desires to kind of match because if intended parents wanted to be in the room, but I wasn't okay with it, well, that's not really a good match. And they would harbor, you know, some uh, being upset or bitterness towards me because I wouldn't let them in the room. So it's like, why would you match with them? So the matching process is super important, but yeah, most of them want to be in there and it's pretty normal for them to be in the room, you know, father like I'm when I'm in the delivery room and you know we can talk about this later but I'm like I'm in game mode I'm in the zone like I don't care where you are but if I need you to rub my back you better rub my back if I need right. you to give me some water, <laughs> give me some water. you're not, not just taking up I'm space like, here like do yeah, your job you're not just like taking up this isn't just like hang out time you know chill like if you want to stay in the corner you can stay in the corner but if I need you you better come running so um but some people are like hey can you stay waist up and you know whatever the surrogate's comfortable with but yeah all that's kind of in contracts that you know you're saying you agree to let them in the room um the on like the eating side of things every now and then some couples will have dietary restrictions if they say hey can you eat more like dairy free or gluten free or whatever mm-hmm. um just for you know wh- the, whatever their desires are they'll give you a an additional like an allowance to pay for more groceries because you're accommodating something that's not it's not normal it's not needed mm-hmm. um and then ob wise you pick your OB. So if you have an OB in your area, you would deliver locally at your hospital with your OB. Um, Sometimes the intended parents have like a say in it, but for ours, for the most part, they were like, you know, whoever you feel comfortable with, you know, we'll feel comfortable with. And I ended up switching this last journey from a midwife to just a regular OB because I didn't feel comfortable Mm -hmm. with the midwife. And the the surrogacy journey is there. It's intense. There's a lot of moving parts. There's a lot of people involved. And if you can't get on board with like what's going on and you're willing to put in the time to meet with us, do a Zoom call, answer questions for the parents because it's their baby, then like, I can't have that. And so we ended up switching and, you know, you want, you want them to feel a part of it. Um, A lot of people ask, do you deliver where the intended parents are? And I'm quick answer. No, because you got to get to your hospital labor. Yeah. If I'm going into labor at 38 and a half weeks, I'm not about to hop on a plane to Florida to go deliver baby. So they come to you several weeks prior, kind of, you know, get an Airbnb, settle in and just get ready for baby. Are they able to put down suggestions at least to say like I'd rather you 
go natural or yes, yeah, having an epidural is okay. Can they put that, yeah. that specific rules down for your labor? Yeah. So again, with matching, that's something you talk about in the matching process. Okay. You, you want to talk about like delivery, um, relationship outside of the journey and it within the journey. Um, and financially, and there's like several really important parts. Um, but one of the things is, yeah, delivery, because some people want you to go more natural. But if as a surrogate, you're like, hey, I have my babies with an epidural, or, you know, that my doctor says I need a C-section, then they need to be okay with that at the, you get the final say as a surrogate, because it's your body. So you are your doctor's patient. Mm -hmm. Then once you deliver from there, it's all their decisions on the baby side of things. But because it's your body, you get the final say, but you do want to say, hey, I prefer to do more natural. Are you okay with that? Or, hey, I prefer to always have an epidural. Are you okay with that? They can't tell you no. Mm -hmm. because I mean, they can like say, Hey, but could you not, but you just, and most of the time they're like, okay, do whatever you need to. Cause you're the one bringing the right. Baby. <laughs> exactly. So, uh, yeah. I want to talk about the psychological side of things too, but my last question about like kind of this mm -hmm. kind of stuff is I could never in a thousand years see a negative from this. Like you are helping pa parents. What an amazing gift, you know, what could happen. Right. But as I was looking at your feed there like every post had some kind of negative, like, aren't you, I yeah. can't believe this. Like yeah. people are, there's so many babies up for adoption. Why would you do this? But one of the ones I also kept seeing about was risk of ovarian cancer. Um, and what are you, what are your thoughts? What is the actual science behind it? Yeah. You know, I honestly will say, I just started thinking about that recently mm -hmm. um, because of the IVF meds, you know, being tied or linking to that. And I, it was never a concern to me because going into it, you have to weigh out those concerns because it's it's a valid concern. It's something that could happen, whether it's that or you lose your reproductive organs or you lose your life. And so mm -hmm. I have to have those tough conversations with my husband and, you know, not with my kids, but in a sense, be prepared that if something were to happen like that, am I prepared for that? And, you know, I just chopped it up as I feel like this is something the Lord is let, allowing me to do and calling me to do. And if that's, if, if that happens because as a result of that, I at least was obedient in doing it. Mm -hmm. And so you have to weigh it out that it is a risk. Um, but yeah, recently with the Lupron that I'm taking too, because it's a new drug that I haven't taken before. Um, you know, there are a lot of side effects with that and, but there's also a risk for walking out of your door and getting in your car. And so it's all, there's so much that could happen. And we just try not to live in fear of like what could happen or what, what could be waiting for us? Because at the end of the day, it could happen. It's not guaranteed. Yeah. Tomorrow's not eating guaranteed. Your, yeah, eating your McDonald's five times a week or smoking a pack of cigarettes, you have your own risk. So it's like, although I have mine, it, I'm making the decisions for me, what I feel like is best for me, what mm -hmm. I desire to do. And it may not match what you want to. And so there's a lot of concerns for that. Um, but you kind of go into it knowing what could happen and you just have to be kind of okay with it. Mm -hmm. um, in terms of like carrying a baby, obviously our natural tendency is to bond immediately. Like, oh my God, there's <laughs> yeah. a baby. So mm -hmm. And I think that's probably people's biggest concern of like, wow, I pregnancy there, cause there are other women, right. Who yeah. they love yeah. being pregnant. And so they're like, wow, this is such a great thing, but I just don't <laughs> understand how at the end you just go, here you go. So what mm -hmm. kind of things do you do during not only just when you're pregnant for those 40 weeks, but also obviously yeah. leading up cause you're already building the connection to the parents and working through all of this now, how do you handle that towards the end and how do you also prepare your children because now they're old enough mm -hmm. to see mommy has a baby belly yeah, yeah. Like, this isn't our baby yeah yeah so a lot of questions and concerns from people being like how can you just give away give away a baby and it's like well it's not my baby it's not my baby to start with and so it makes it easier because the way you view it is just like giving baby back <laughs> and that I I can say that you are emotionally attached to the baby because we prayed for the baby. We like, I wanted the best for the baby's life. I wanted the best for, you know, their life with the parents. And so I cared for the baby and I feel like any normal surrogate would, you want the best for them, but on a maternal side, like it wasn't my role to fill as a mother. And so I kept going back to that, that at the end of the day, I can still love for this baby and care for this baby while it's in my care. But from the moment it's not, 
it's now, it's now in their family's hands and their mom's hands and, and that it's not my baby anymore. And so I just viewed it as that, like, in a sense, babysitting thing that, that I was just caring for the baby and, you know, doing what I needed to for that time. Um, a lot of mental preparation went into it and, and prior to transfer, you know, you remind yourself, this isn't our baby. The moment we find out we're pregnant, it's not, it's not, it's not uh, we're pregnant. It's, no, it's not, we're pregnant. It's they're pregnant. You're excited for those milestones as you should be, but you're excited in a different way. You're excited for them. Like, mm-hmm. oh my gosh, you know, um, heartbeat was strong. It was this like baby's moving. Okay. I'm excited for them. Okay. You know, here's the gender, like we're excited for them and you're not planning a nursery. You're not picking out a name, you know, you're not buying baby clothes, even though you kind of may as like a gift Mm -hmm. or whatever, but it just feels different because, you know, going into, it's not yours. It's different. It's not like a mom who's giving their baby up for an adoption where they have to have this heartbreaking moment and make a decision to hand that baby off. The decision's made for us. Like it's, it's not our baby. And so, um, we, one of the things I researched back when I first was looking into it was, how to mentally handle it. And there was a documentary, I wish I remembered it. I ended up watching on YouTube, I think. And they talked about planning something as a family to do postpartum. Um, You know, after you heal, like do something as a family that instead of looking at it as, man, I don't have a baby and now I'm empty inside. It's no, I have my family. I have my kids. I have my husband and I have, you know, my life. Let's do something fun. And that's when we um, just decided to do RV life and just take off on this adventure. We ended up getting a new puppy. We were planning to get a puppy anyways, but it kind of worked out with the timing of postpartum and getting the new puppy that I poured my maternal instincts. As I was say, those like, pregnancy hormones and, went into the puppy. Yes, <laughs> potty training and cuddling the puppy. And so that all, like my mind was quickly taken off of, I don't have a baby and the journey's over. And now it's this, that I, I didn't even take two seconds to really think about it because we jumped right into it. Like immediately after I, I delivered, it was a week or two later, we were downsizing and moving into an RV and hitting the road. Like I was three weeks postpartum at my doctor's appointment and like hitting the road the next day. So, um, that really helped take my, take my mind and focus off of what was what I didn't have anymore, but Mm -hmm. then to now what I do still have in front of me. And with the kids, um, we, we prepped them at the beginning. Hey, mommy and daddy know somebody who doesn't, who can't have a baby. Do you think it would be nice if we help them have a baby? And they're like, Oh yeah. When we first started, I think they were like three and five or maybe two and a half. I think, I think three and five though. And so they didn't quite understand. They're like, Oh, sounds good. Is the baby in your belly? Is the baby in your belly? (laughs) Um, and so as the baby grew, my daughter was like, love touching my belly, love rubbing belly and kissing baby. And we would always remind them, Oh, is it baby? Oh, baby's moving. Mm -hmm. Who's baby, you know, whose baby is this? And they would say, you know, their names. And it was just so cute to see them. But I was nervous for that, like postpartum transition because they, neither of them remember. My son doesn't remember my daughter coming home because he was only nine months. So he doesn't remember like gaining a sibling that we never talked about the baby being a sibling, or we never said sister or brother. We always said and reminded them that the baby is for someone else and they knew them. And I think them meeting them helped put that connection together like okay baby is theirs Mm -hmm. you know mommy just has baby and you know I'm curious later in life how they'll look back at it and kind of view it or now that they're getting older and they are seeing it in a different lens um but that was one of the the thoughts of doing surrogacy again was are my kids how did they handle the transition because if they didn't handle it well postpartum then I'm not going to put that through put them through that again sure. but they did so well um we did the whole like whenever they met baby um and they ended up uh, they were leaving the next day. We brought a gift for each of the kids uh, like, oh, this is from baby. And so it, they got to switch their focus to just like we did with RV life and getting a puppy. They had Legos and kinetic sand. And so they got to play with that. And I want to say like a couple days later, they asked to see a picture. And then maybe like a week later, they were like, oh yeah, baby was in your belly. Uh-huh. And, um, and then honestly, it was like, after that was like a few more weeks and then maybe a few months. And then now, um, I want to say they mention it every now and then, but it's mm-hmm. not anything that they're just like, oh yeah, you know, how old, was, how old is the baby that was in your belly? Like they don't, they don't really remember it. Mm-hmm. So I'm glad that they transitioned well. And I'm assuming from you to your point, point of view, having the parents in the delivery room and being able to hand that baby and see, I mean, 
I'm sure this isn't like a nine month struggle that they've gone through. It's been years. Yeah. And I'm sure it was very hard yeah. decision to go the surrogacy route. So to see them with this amazing, beautiful gift that they've wished for, for all these years. Yeah. And it sounds like you're a spiritual person yeah. probably also helped with the letting go. Yes, like for this sure. is your baby. I'm here. You yeah. go. Yeah, for sure. It all like comes, it all comes full circle and it all like, is this moment of that's, that's why I did this. Like mm -hmm. that made it all worth it. And it was, it's so crazy. I, it's the hardest thing to explain, but it's an immediate, like, all right, I'm done. Babies, babies, there's like for me, at least. And mm -hmm. for my experience, it wasn't hard for me to detach because the, when you see the parents' faces of them holding their baby and looking you in the eyes and saying, thank you for this, like, that I'm going to like tear up. I'm, I, like, I'm about to be like, I moment. can't even imagine yeah. like it's making me smile so big. Just imagining like, this I gift that you're able to give people. Close, yes. I can close my eyes and just like vividly remember they were on this side of me, like saying thank you. And then seeing them in the chair, doing skin to skin with their baby and just like in awe of like they're here type of thing. And like looking at Dan and being like, we did it. Like it all coming full circle made it all worth it. And it like, it makes I, it's the craziest thing. I can't explain how you just, your mind and heart just like detach, but yet you're, you're still connected because you're thankful mm -hmm. for like what happened, but it's, it's not yours. And so now it's their time to enjoy this baby while you were enjoying caring baby. It's like, it's crazy. Does surrogacy have a, like when you go for your implantation, does it have a, um, higher chance of taking versus a couple that is going through IVF? Um, it just depends, honestly, with the egg quality or the embryo mm -hmm. quality grade and then uterus, uterine thickening, mm -hmm. um, or lining thickening. And then just, um, if you have higher risk pregnancies or lower risk, there's so many different factors involved that it's hard to say, mm -hmm. like our, the fertility doctor for the last journey, he said this has about an 85% chance of working, which is actually pretty high. I want to mm -hmm. say, don't quote me on this, but I want to say like 75% is kind of normal, um, with a lower grade, grade embryo, obviously it's going to be lower, but I have seen people take like one of the lowest grade, like mosaic embryos, their last embryo that they have and implant it. And they had a healthy baby boy. So it is like, it's hard to say, um, what, you know, what would take what, what won't it is, in a sense, a stars have to align type of thing that there are so many factors that have to be in place that you kind of just implant and pray because you, it's you just don't freaking know. incredible what science can do nowadays in your contract. So uh, when you go for this current round that you're training yeah. for, if it doesn't take, is it someone in your contract that you have like three tries or something like that? Yeah. Yeah. Three transfers is pretty typical. Oh, okay. Sometimes, sometimes if it was like all high quality embryos, your lining was thick and it was just this fluke thing that none of them took. Mm -hmm. Um, sometimes they'll do like an amendment to the contract and add in like, Hey, let's do another transfer based off of the doctor's, you know, protocol or doctor's request, you know, let's do it again. Um, but typically it's three, because then at that point it's a lot of one, it's, you know, a lot of embryos that, you know, sadly didn't make it. And then the doctors kind of, you have to start ruling out, well, what's the problem here? Is it the embryo quality? Cause if so, then maybe they need to get donor embryos or a different embryo to, you know, have higher quality if it's not the surrogate, but if it's, if the, if the embryos are all high quality, then maybe it is the surrogate's body and maybe just something's off. One of her levels isn't there that maybe it is that, but then there's times where maybe it's the fertility doctor or the clinic. So there's, it's hard to say. And so you just kind of want everything to be the best that it can be mm -hmm. for the best outcome possible. Do you feel like surrogacy is becoming a little bit more popular? Mm -hmm. I do think so. And I will say, I think a lot of it is from social media and sharing about it. And now that not saying that, like, because of me, people are sharing, but, um, the gal that I followed mama Rupert, and then there was probably a handful of other ones that shared at that time. But now like it's all over my, for you page, all over my explore page. And I love it. It's, it's encouraging to see. It's exciting to see that from sharing uh, our experience or sharing the journey that others, feel compelled to share theirs too. Cause it's mm -hmm. just encouraging 
to a lot of intended parents, a lot of intended parents will message me and say, Hey, thanks for sharing. Because it gives us hope that one, there's like, you know, normal, good ladies out there that can carry mm-hmm. my baby. Cause you're trusting someone with life with your the most you know, your important thing that and, you'll ever do. Yeah, exactly. And it's a lot of money involved and a lot of risk. Like there's so many, there's so much fear with it, but sharing to give them hope and that, Hey, there's, you know, there's someone out there to carry your baby and, um, you know, that, and then just to encourage surrogates. And so it's mm-hmm. been fun seeing people, but I think for sure, because of more people sharing and sharing online and going through the journey that there are more surrogates now than ever, ever before, which is awesome. Because when you look at it, I want to say a year ago, when we looked, it was only like 800 surrogates in the U S oh, wow. a year. And I would have thought it was like thousands. Sure. So I don't know what it is now, but I'm curious to see, mm-hmm. you know, cause there's circuits all over the world, but in the U S I just would have thought it would have been more than that. Mm-hmm. Um, but maybe in the next couple of years that will double or triple. Now I know people are sitting here wondering like, wait, pregnancy was great for me. I loved it. I wouldn't mind being pregnant, but what's in it for me financially, yeah. is there pretty good gains in it? And you don't have to say like how much no, your yeah. contracts are by any means. Yeah, you're good. Just... So, um, there, there's standards of like compensation. So compensation is standard in the U S in oh, really? Canada. Uh-huh. So in Canada, it's altruistic. So you can't get paid for it, but you still have your medical premiums covered. Anything related to the pregnancy or the journey is covered. Um, but in the U S in Canada, it's altruistic. Yeah. It, okay. yeah. So you can't, you can't get compensated for sure, it. Yeah. But so when people, a lot of times in our comments, people say, well, why are you getting compensated for it? Like you should just do it out of the kindness of your heart. Like, how are you a upright human? If you're not, if you're getting compensated for it. And I can argue both sides. Like sure. I can, I can argue getting compensated and uncompensated. And I truly think that it's, it can be rewarding both ways, mm-hmm. you know, not just when you get paid or not because you didn't get paid. I think it can still be just as rewarding. Um, but in Canada, it's not, but in the U S it is common. There are times where if someone does it for a family member or a friend, they're willing to take less compensation just because they, you know, truly just want to help them. And they're not looking for that gain, but just because someone does get compensated, I don't, I don't see it as like, they're trying to gain from it. It's just, you're dedicating your life for a year plus to somebody else for their, for their gain. And you look at it as like, it's a mutual beneficial thing. Like Mm -hmm. you're helping the intended parents. They're helping you by, you know, blessing you with this income to, you know, for your family or your future. And, you know, you're helping them, they're helping you type of thing. And so, um, your, the compensation is about, and then average is probably 30 to 50,000 for your first time as a surrogate. And then mm-hmm. each, each additional one is kind of like 5,000 more. Um, but there's, I've heard of surrogates, first time surrogates requesting 70,000, 80,000 or second time surrogates mm-hmm. requesting a hundred thousand. So everyone to each their own of like mm-hmm. what they think is an amount. I mean, just like I talked to my sister, she's like, I would never do surrogacy. You couldn't pay me a million dollars to become a surrogate. And so there's, there's some surrogates who like, maybe they do have hard pregnancies and they're like, you know what, if I'm going to do this, I got to make sure it's in a sense worth it for me. Sure. And so they may request more, um, but um, average is that. And then it's like your medical premiums are covered. Um, they usually give you a little bit of allowance each month to travel to and from appointments, um, medication co-pays. And there's like a life insurance policy that's taken out. And so anything in regards to the pregnancy or the journey is covered. Um, it's just the kind of like the wear on your body and, yeah. you know, physically, physically it's demanding on you. Sure. Um, when, so when is right now things scheduled for you? Yeah. Yeah. So our transfer right now is scheduled for November 13th. So I am in um, my my medicated cycle right now. So I'm on Lupron to suppress ovulation. And then I just started estrogen. So the estrogen is, I want to say I'm almost a week on it. Um, it's thickening my lining. So for the next couple of weeks, we're prepping that uterine lining for transfer on November 6th. I'll have my baseline ultrasound. If my th- lining is thick enough, which they want it to be seven millimeters or thicker. Um, cause that's for optimal transfer that like baby can, you know, cushion in there and the uterine lining, if it's over seven, then we'll move forward with um, booking flights for transfer. And so we'll fly out to Florida, stay with our intended parents and do transfer November 13th. And then at that point we'll be pregnant until proven otherwise. (laughs) That's super exciting. Now I know in one of your recent Instagrams, you had mentioned that 
the ultrasound wasn't quite what you had hoped for, but then you're going yeah. to go back. So are things looking better now? Yeah. So they, the second one, um, and I think I got people a little worried because I was like, oh, the cyst from my first um, ultrasound, it was, it was small. It's a small little cyst, which mm-hmm. cysts are normal. And they, right. a lot of times they just kind of like dissipate in it or whatever. But the second time it was still there. I, I say that it wasn't what I hoped for. Cause I was hoping the cyst would just be gone so that it wasn't an issue. Um, but the main thing was my estrogen level was way lower, which is what they want. They didn't want okay. it to be elevated, but because I had that cyst that first week, it was elevated. But the second week, my estrogen was lower and the cyst was still there. It was only like 0.3 millimeters bigger. Oh, wow. uh-huh. But I think whenever I mentioned the cyst, people were like, you have a cyst. My mom called me and she's like, you have a cyst. And I was like, it's okay. <laughs> like, it's not, it's not like a big one. It's just right. a small one. Like it's normal. And like, if it was something to be worried about, I would have called you. Um, but yeah, the clinic was, wasn't worried about it. And um, yeah, so Thankfully, everything looked good enough to start the medicated cycle. Are you thinking this might be your last one? Or are you just kind of open from one event to the next and see how it goes? You know, you know I, we planned on doing it once. I didn't plan on like doing surrogacy for years to come. Um, we really wanted a close relationship with our intended parents and our first ones desired to stay more private and not have that. And so I did feel like I couldn't just not do it again because mm-hmm. I really wanted that. And so we did decide to do it again. And the couple that we've matched with now, Jake and Kenzie, they're amazing. So sweet. Um, Literally like some of our closest friends, because we do have so much in common and because of them, like I'm excited for this next journey. And I would have said this is our last journey because I, again, I didn't plan on doing multiple, but I can't say for sure that if they didn't want another one that I would be able to say no but I don't want to rematch. So if we do do it again, it would be with them. And if I don't do it again, then that's because my body didn't heal correctly. The kids didn't transition well. It's just not in our best interest or it's a lot on your body. Like even working out and preparing my body right now for for transfer, I'm like, my body has changed so much. (laughs) It's kind of exhausting because I am very like happy and comfortable with where I'm at physically right now that I don't feel like I need to lose weight or like do much, but because of the baby, because of getting ready to get pregnant, I feel the need to like be in better shape because I'm about to gain. Like everyone's pregnant. always like, I got to get in shape to get pregnant. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. exactly. I'm about to put on weight. So I have to like drop a few pounds. And so it's kind of, it's kind of draining on like the physical side of it, mm-hmm. but the emotionally, emotional, mental, spiritual side of it. Like I, I love that side of things and, you know, just the process of being pregnant. So I always say, we'll see. I can't say yes or no, yeah. but there's, there's a high possibility, but who knows? We don't right. know. And I know that I'm starting to crouch on your time, but you brought up with the, um, your fitness and your body. And so this is actually a great way to end is you yeah. have an amazing hack. I'm a nutrition coach as well. And yeah. I teach meal prep and meal planning. And some people were giving you crap in the, <laughs> your comments, kind of like teasing you, but I was like, holy crap, Sam, this is an amazing idea. <laughs> All right. Share your uh-huh. meal prep hack that you did this past week. <laughs> okay. So this past week was a uh, Texas roadhouse, <laughs> but now I wouldn't necessarily couple, recommend Texas roadhouse. Yeah, not Texas roadhouse. That idea. Was like, <laughs> yes. Um, but it's called mess restaurant meal prep. And the one that went crazy viral was Chipotle. And I love Chipotle. And I would say out of all the fast food restaurants, Burger King, McDonald's, whatever, Chipotle is less greasy, sure. more healthy options available. Guacamole, salsa, you know, chicken, rice, brown rice. It's it's a healthier option than something else. So they have catering that you can get and you just use it to meal prep. If you would, after, you know, workout or just like lunch, go out and get Chipotle. Instead of getting it, you just order <laughs> catering. It's going to be a little bit cheaper prep. per meal ordering yeah. catering wise. Yeah. And then you just divided it up into daily containers. And I was, was like, awesome. What? Yeah. As a I nutrition coach, I feel like I've done a disservice to my clients of not <laughs> recommending like, hey, if right. you don't have time, but you have the finances and the means to do it, yeah. go. And, and even mean. at Texas Roadhouse, you could still do a catering. I mean, most places you can get chicken, mm-hmm. steak, salad. Yeah, just say no rolls and no butter. <laughs> so that you're Which not tempted. I've never had Texas Roadhouse. So I feel like I'm missing out because I always see all these things on the butter and the rolls. <laughs> it's 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 another level for sure. It's so yeah. good. <laughs> So while your husband was giving you crap on it, 
Yes. I was like, he's enjoying it, by the way. (laughs) Did he take that with him for his hunting trip? No, he didn't. But we did the Texas Roadhouse I got was before we went camping. Um, So we ate a little bit the night before. And then the night we went camping, I heated up on the grill because I'm like, who wants to set up a tent and then cook a full meal on the Blackstone? I'm like, I just want to heat up, literally heated up our barbecue chicken, had salad with their homemade ranch, mashed potatoes on the grill, heated up green beans and we had rolls. I'm like, this is the best first night. You're getting your protein. You're getting your healthy fats from the butter. You're getting your micros from the salad. You're getting your carbs from the potatoes and the rolls. That's a bad exactly. thing. Thank you. Thank you for validating my <laughs> desire. It was one of those things that I'm like, you know, again, Texas Roadhouse, not as much, but Chipotle or there's other restaurants out there that you could do cater family style meals for healthy options. But even though it's costly, it's like my time right now in this season, especially is worth so much to me that for me to just set aside a little chunk of money to not have to meal prep because meal prepping takes hours. That's what I was going to say. Like it might be expensive, but if you calculate how much your time is worth when you're cooking, shopping, cleaning the kitchen, prepping everything, it might be worth it for you. And that's why I wanted to share it because other people might go like, oh, that's a great idea. Yes. Yeah. And there's on Chipotle, they have like two or three different options, whether you want one protein or two proteins, and then you get to pick your side. So if you don't want cheese on it, don't do cheese. If you don't want tortilla, don't do tortilla. You can literally just have meat, rice, and salsa, which is healthy. (laughs) And if you're able to take the two proteins, it's not like you're eating the same meal every day. You can Mm -hmm. do like a rice bowl with chicken one day, a rice bowl with steak the next, a taco salad with chicken the next. Exactly. Yeah. I don't mind eating the same thing. So on like a meal prep side when you meal prep, it's the same thing, breakfast, lunch, and dinner every day. I don't mind it. Some people do. So if you do, it may not be the best for you, but it's, it's healthy and it's convenient. (laughs) We don't eat the same thing, but I, I prep, I takes me six (gasps) hours to cook every Sunday because I do every Sunday. Yeah. (laughs) How many people are in their kitchen meal prepping on Sunday, just exhausted. (laughs) But Like we need this. It's so Exactly. So you guys, great tip. I support it 100%. Yes. Thank you. Yes. So Sam, where can people find more about you and keep up with your journey through all this? Yeah. We share on all platforms that we are Dan and Sam and on my website, we are Dan and Sam.com. We share a lot of surrogacy resources. So if you are listening to this and you're like, Hey, I want to see if I made the requirements or what the process looks like for a surrogate, you can head over there and get some more information. Awesome. And just like, we'll keep you and the your Florida matches yeah, uh, in our thoughts and prayers for Thank sure. You. Have they already gone through like in vitro before or IVF or they do haven't? Even... Just based off of um her story. health and yeah, just sure. based off of your story, their doctor said, "Hey, surrogacy is the best route," and so that's why they're pursuing it. Um, which is good that they don't have to come from a lot of loss, and so right. hopefully, you know, everything works good with our journey, and they'll have their babies soon. Well, sending you our prayers and good luck. And I will make sure to keep up with you on everything. (laughs) Thanks so much. Yay. Thank you.